this Georgia as heavy as I was. It's called acanthosis. 18 plus percent of our children right now are obese. How loud are you? About 280. If you go with the flow in America today, you will end up overweight or obese, as two thirds of Americans do. I don't want to be fat for the rest of my life. I've got diabetes. Sleep apnea. High blood pressure. I get dizzy when I get up. Everything's hurting now. You don't crave broccoli, and our generation has grown up craving a Big Mac. We have built a cheap food model, and that's the one we're dealing with right now. It's so hard to combat against what the TV's telling you to buy your kids. The kind of food that we eat is the kind that's most profitable. Local and regional foods taste better. The weight of the nation is out of control, but we can fix that. How do you like the market? Market means everything for this neighborhood. We have got to come together as a country and really make this a priority. As long as we stick together, that's what it's about. It's not only health, it's about survival and well-being of the United States as a nation. The reason we have government in the first place is to solve problems collectively that we can't solve individually. If we don't now take this as a really serious, urgent national priority, we are all of us individually and as a nation gonna pay a really serious price. I think obesity is perhaps the biggest threat to the health of this country, to the health, welfare, and future of this country. This type of an epidemic is not something that we've seen before, really in human history, where a chronic disease like obesity over 25 years has become the norm in a population. In the future, it wouldn't surprise me if people look back on the early part of the 21st century and call this the obesity era. A third of Americans are obese, another third is overweight, and those numbers continue to rise. Now we have this complicated problem, and you wonder, will it be almost everyone in society unless we figure out how to stop it? I've had high blood pressure since I was 11 years old. I have a history of heart disease on both sides of my family. I'm on actually 13 different medications. Every night I have to sleep with the machine on, a breathing machine. I'm starting to develop neuropathy in my feet, just tingling and, and cold. I have a lot of pain, you know, that I deal with every day. Uh, feet, ankles, lots of swelling. High blood pressure, high cholesterol, sleep apnea, I have asthma. I have a, a bit of a liver issue. I 
I just recently became diabetic. I'm borderline diabetic, so I'm just right there, like, skating by. I just know that that's always knocking at the back door. I'm worried about not being able to live as long as I could because of my weight. I'm 39, and it seems like time is slipping away. I may not be here as long as I would like to be. Estimates are that our nation spends $150 billion a year on the health consequences of obesity. Obese individuals, as they age, they're going to have more and more of these medical consequences. So the cost is going to get even higher. How loud are you? About 280. What's going on with your blood pressure this morning? Why is it so high? That scares me a little bit. It's still up a little bit, but... We were suffering greatly from increasing health care costs. We realized the depth and breadth of the health issues that existed in our company. When we first did the screening, we had so many serious health concerns. And we're going to get your height and weight. It was really about what is going to kill this person the fastest. 55% of our folks weighed over 200 pounds. We had 30% over 225, and about 20% over 250 pounds. It was a shocker, to say the least. They had hypertension, they had high blood pressure, high cholesterol, they had diabetes. The concern was, what's gonna happen to them? Are they headed for a stroke? Are they headed for a heart attack? We're worried about them personally, but we're also worried about the impact that uh, the lack of wellness would have on our ability to function as a company. It makes it tougher. You see the skinnier guys, they can just hop right up on there, and me, I'm climbing, you know. It, it makes it tougher, it really does. What we do on the job, you know, there's a lot of lifting and bending over and stuff. You're climbing ladders. You're running up there about 50 to 60 pounds with your tools. You're already carrying, say, 60 or 70 pounds of fat or more. So you're you're weighted down by the time the day's over with your feet's killing you, your legs are cramping, you know. And you can't last as long as you used to. All this stuff's related to weight. So yeah, I showed up, but I just wasn't very productive. And then you've got folks who, they're just sick. I eat a lot of fried food. Fast food, yeah. You can just pull in somewhere and you grab a bite to eat and it's not healthy. I usually don't have really anything for breakfast. Uh, I usually skip breakfast. By the time I get home, it's so easy just to throw a, a pizza in the oven, you know, frozen pizza. I could probably do a lot better and I, I need to, I, I do need to do better. Our natural tendency is to see this as an individual responsibility. People might say, it's your own fault. You should live better, you should eat better, you should exercise more. But what the biology is telling us is that the roots of many health problems, including obesity, are often laid down early in life when it is outside of the individual's control. Overeating is as much about biology as psychology. What's going on in the brain that makes some people overeat, feel out of control, not be able to stop eating. The stigma against obese people reflects a lack of understanding about what is it that we control and what is it that we don't control. Why do I eat even when I'm not hungry? Why is there so much stigma? I've tried everything and nothing's working. When it comes to smoking or drinking, people generally have to go cold turkey. 
but fundamentally we have to eat. You know, people can't stop eating. This calls for a somewhat lonely journey of self-control. We underestimate how hard it is to change your behavior, not once, not for a week or a month till you're cured, but to change it every day for the rest of your life. Excess is really new in human history. We're simply not genetically programmed to turn down calories when they're in front of us. It made a lot of sense through human history. It's not working well for us right now. Evolution happens very slowly. Humans evolved over hundreds of thousands of years in Africa and then spread across the world. And our DNA has not changed that much since the period of time before modern society. But modern society is now racing ahead at an incredible rate. And that mismatch explains why we have, to some extent, this obesity problem today. We are designed for a very specific type of environment low availability of calories, need for energy expenditure to get the calories. For most of uh, human experience, it was challenging uh, to be able to find enough food. It's that condition, scarcity. That's what built us, that's what defined us. And if you look at our physiology, our psychology, our sociology, our culture, all those things were driven by scarcity. They're all responses to scarcity. So our bodies, the way, that we, the way that we digest food, the reasons we prefer certain foods, uh, the reasons we put on weight and keep it on, all those are responses to scarcity. We're wired, we're sort of adapted to get really excited about things that are sweet and contain a lot of fat. That very fat in the diet actually blunts our body's ability to pay attention to hormones that tell us to stop eating. Back in the day, when there wasn't a lot of food available to us, and we were presented with a, a, a kill, a, a large animal, we needed to consume as much of it as we possibly could over a short period of time. Because we didn't have refrigeration, the product would go rancid. We couldn't have the brain saying, after we had a couple of bites, you're full, step away from the carcass, you need to stop eating. We had to override those signals. And if you ate those foods, you were more likely to survive, not just in the short term, but in the long term, in the times when food was more scarce. That created an evolutionary pressure for the development of certain brain reward circuitry. I'm at the beginning of civilization. I find a banana, I've never eaten it, I eat it. And there is this sweetness, this extraordinary pleasure. Immediately my brain learns a type of learning that will lead me the next time, just with one exposure, that I see that yellow color, immediately desire it. And it's not something voluntary, it's automatic, and it will give, motivate me to climb the tree, take the banana, and eat it. And that conditioning, is extremely powerful and it's indispensable for survival. The human biology by 10,000 years ago was finely tuned to living within a hunter-gatherer environment. Eventually, the foraging diet can no longer support the populations we have and we have to shift to an entirely new strategy. We can no longer forage for food, we have to start producing it. We have to become farmers. <laughs> When agriculture started to appear, villages and settlements came along with it. We started to live in very different environments. At the end of the 19th century, the United States is really at this turning point where our population's growing. We've got to make some decisions about food security. What's our approach to food going to be? And then in a blink of an eye, something huge happened. And, and, and that thing was that we got modern agriculture. We realized that if we wanted to be strong militarily and be strong economically, we were going to have to have a, a ready supply of food. That was absolutely essential. 
by the early 20th century, there's this full court press by the federal government to industrialize food to the point where we can produce cheap food. And it's everything from subsidizing farmers to heavily promoting research. And what this allows the United States to do, faster than any other country, is to raise our per acre yields. We were able to, for example, double the number of bushels of corn from 1930 to 1940. So now we find ourselves with a great abundance of grain. And so the next question is, what do we do with all this? We're exporting a great deal of it to overseas markets. At the same time, we found that we could fatten up our animals much faster when we fed them on grain. We wanted to keep food prices very cheap, and we wanted to keep prices stable. And so we built this entire food economy from the ground up, very specifically targeting this notion of surplus. In the last 100 years, we have industrialized our food supply. So you have this change in our approach to food, but there are other changes that were sort of going on in parallel. The same technological advances that were allowing us to produce more food more cheaply were changing other parts of our life. The question is, what changed in the last 30 years to make this obesity epidemic happen? The communities that we live in have changed and have become car dependent. We don't walk, we don't bike, and it's cut off hundreds of calories of physical activity. In fact, roughly one in four adults gets no physical activity at all. We are now this kind of automated society all of our modern day developments have been labor saving. We've engineered physical activity out of our everyday lives. Our work as adults has been increasingly sedentary. We send messages on our computers and emails. We don't even walk to the next office to speak to somebody. Screen time has just skyrocketed. People have multiple screens in their lives in addition to the television. The number of calories we burn off has been diminishing in the setting of heavily advertised, calorically rich food that can be bought inexpensively. Our food environment is hostile to healthy eating. We're living in an environment in which it's possible to eat yourself into obesity on a single city block and in which you can call in an unlimited number of calories. There's this relentless and powerful marketing of foods. You're basically taught that you can eat everywhere, you can eat every hour of the day, and that there's something gloriously wonderful about eating foods that are high in sugar, fat, and salt. It's all these cues in our faces. It's an assault. And it's something that we can't ignore. Everybody is so hectic and rushing around so much. Families are busy. There may not be a family meal. They have to get fast food, convenient food. That tends to be the least healthy food. Roughly 55% of food expenditures today go towards food consumed outside of the home. Restaurant portions are maybe two to five times what we need. Research shows that when people are served more, they eat more. Portion sizes have gone up across so many categories of food. Today's American is eating and drinking about 600 more calories per day than they were in 1970. And that can easily add up to an additional five or 10 pounds of unnecessary weight gain through the course of a year. So obesity is the end result of a huge number of trends that have come together. The lifestyle that we have adopted has led to this toxic environment. It is simply too 
easy to consume too many calories and too difficult to expend those calories. In the last 30 years, our DNA has not changed, but our environment has. from population studies that obesity affects some communities more than others. Uh, that's true geographically, for instance, where the southeast has a higher frequency than, say, Colorado. The rates of chronic disease are much higher in low-income communities, and the rates of obesity-related chronic disease are way higher. Just the built environment that people live in, their access to nutritious food as opposed to things that are high in calories and relatively low in nutritive value. It's systematically different in communities of color and communities with lower incomes. Where you live matters, and it matters a lot. Another way of putting this is, does your zip code matter more than your genetic code? This is Baltimore, Maryland where they have a census tract down near the Inner Harbor with a life expectancy of 62 years, and another life expectancy up in northern Baltimore, 82 years, a 20-year life expectancy difference. This is Cuyahoga County, Cleveland, where we thus far have found the greatest disparity in, in life expectancy. This is Huff, an inner city neighborhood with the average life expectancy of 64 years, and eight miles down the road is Lindhurst with a life expectancy of close to 90 years. Understanding what drives that disparity is gonna help us understand what is driving the chronic disease epidemic. It's gonna help us understand the tools and strategies to get underneath the obesity epidemic. Aquí en Santana hace falta un parque para los niños. Pues no que están los pobres ahí esperando hasta que se van los carros para poder jugar. There are many communities throughout the country where it's really hard for kids to get physical activity. There may not be parks, there may not be safe spaces where I can exercise. There certainly may not be gyms or any of the other amenities that you might find in a in a middle class or a, or a wealthy community. ¿Y usted tiene sus niños aquí? Sí, mire, el, el mío es el de la playera blanca. Ellos necesitan un lugar donde hay espacio. Y como no tenemos dinero para transportarnos a los parques que están retirados, ¿y qué hacemos? Nos quedamos aquí y lo único que hacemos, vamos al parque. Mm -hmm. Dile a dónde te llevó tu mamá en inglés, en inglés el sábado. Wow. Well. I went Saturday to Carrillo Park. I don't know if you guys know about it. Not that good of an example, but I... Well, you are not a very good example. Well, because I'm kind of fat. But can't they just make a little bigger park or a better park somewhere here, near here? Because all these parking lots are in, like, kind of the park we have. The challenge is to construct environments, particularly for young people, that we know will be much more conducive to them maintaining a healthy weight. Being poor doesn't just mean that you don't have enough money. It means that you are also going to be exposed to a whole host of influences and forces that we know are bad for your health.
go into a poor neighborhood anywhere in America, in a small store, what do you see there? Chips, soda, candy. You can cook a healthy meal from stuff that are on a bodega. Anyway, you don't need to because everything here is already processed and prepared. Everything here, it's just more sugar, more sugar, more sugar, more sweets. You walk in that door and you see immediately three liter bottles of soda uh, for a dollar. That's the epidemic right there. Those are exactly the items that are, frankly, killing people these days. And we do know that 90% of Bronx residents do shop, get their food from uh, Bodega. But while they're here, though, they're also getting many items that have lots of calories. So at these corner stores, for just over a dollar a day, in Philadelphia, kids are buying um, probably about 350 calories. Ooh. And generally, it's chips and sugary drinks, like hugs. A bag of chips and a grape soda, breakfast of champions. That's right. <laughs> and uh, for just, just a little over a dollar. I've got uh, two bananas and an apple. 125. You're in this area, this bag is 25 cents. If you go to City Line Avenue in a vending machine, this bag will be 75 cents on up, and it won't be marked 25 cents. So it starts with the company. Right, they charge a little more in the neighborhoods where they can Get make up for the cost, and right. they keep it cheap here and move product. Is there anything that you're able to sell that's on Healthy. the healthier side that competes price-wise with this? No, not at all. For 25 cents? Kids, they know no vegetable or fruits. You know, they may know apples and oranges, but I mean, I tell you, I had a kid the other day I was eating in here, and he asked me what that was. It was I was eating broccoli, fresh broccoli, you know, raw broccoli, dipping it. And he asked me what it was. Some of the kids are raised on this stuff. You know, every day, it's morning time, they come in, two bags of chips, soda, candy. You know, this is a big part of these kids' diet. We are seeing higher rates of obesity as incomes go down in America. If you're worried about where you're gonna get that next meal, then when you do have money for that next meal, you wanna use your few dollars as efficiently as possible. So you're gonna buy the items first that are readily available, second, you're gonna buy the very large portion sizes, and third, you're gonna buy items that have lots of calories. Anytime I want fast food, I just stand here and go like, hmm. Two, four, six, eight, value menu. Oh, for just five bucks. So good, and just a buck each. Only a buck each. Just three dollars. Made with fresh egg, sausage. Two bucks could get you a biscuit with gravy and an egg. The new BK breakfast muffin sandwich for a buck. A cheeseburger's a dollar. Huh? Wow. Those dollar menus are always available. <laughs> now they're open 24 hours. Chicken sandwich on the dollar menu every day. Two things for four dollars and one for two. Or five things for two. Or one for six and two for two. 99 cent everyday value menu. Dollar menu, boy, you can eat pretty good. When you buy those items, you're going to put on weight as a result of that. You'll still be hungry when everybody else is hungry at the next meal. Uh, but now you've become more overweight. The mac and cheese big daddy patty melt. And you thought just the name was a mouthful. The new Let's Get Cheesy menu, starting at $4.99, only at Denny's. Companies have marketed value to us so much that we think we need to get as much food for our money as possible. Hang off the plate ribs. The never-ending pasta bowl. New honey barbecue shrimp. Extra meaty. Bursting with sweet. Grand slam to every Extra large. You're gonna put the most advertising dollars into those products that have the highest margins. And the highest margins are typically on those food products that have had the greatest level of processing. Craft singles. Hot pockets. And typically, they're foods that we so now recognize are sort of central to this whole ob obesity problem. And yet, those are the foods that the industry makes the most money from. Because they're making the most money from them, they're willing to spend the most.
Over the past few decades, we've seen a tremendous increase in obesity rates. At the same time, we've seen a tremendous increase in corn and soy production, and we've also seen a proliferation of fast food restaurants. These trends are not independent. In fact, the increase in corn and soy production has made it very inexpensive, say, for, for McDonald's to feed all their cattle with low-cost corn. And products with high fructose corn syrup or soy-based fats and oils are increasingly available. And in fact, they're increasingly available at low cost. If you look at the USDA and where it says the cause of obesity is, it's an increase in our calorie consumption over the last 30, 35 years. And what's accounting for that increase? A quarter of it is thought to be added sugars, like those from corn. A quarter of it, roughly, is thought to be from added fats, most of which are from soy. Almost half is from refined grains, namely corn starches, wheat, and the like. The government subsidy programs are heavily tilted towards these large commodity crops, wheat, corn, sugar, dairy. The large livestock operations and poultry operations are subsidized indirectly by the cheap feed, the large supplies of corn and soybeans, which make up the predominant feed grains for poultry and other livestock. The grains that are used to make the buns or to feed the cows that go into the burgers are subsidized in cost. The cost of the unhealthy food is artificially low. Because of subsidies, it's cheaper to make these kind of meals than it otherwise would be. The government's helping you when you buy these sort of meals. This maximizes profit margins for the food company. The fact that the portions have grown so large is a major issue. If you decide instead to order a salad in a bottle of water, Uncle Sam becomes disinterested, closes up his wallet, and walks away. From the mid-1980s until the present time, the price of soft drinks went up by only 20%. That's less than the cost of inflation. But you can see that fruits and vegetables went up by 117%. So during that period of time, it became relatively more attractive to buy sugared beverages and less attractive to buy fruits and vegetables. The way to think about the link between farm policy and obesity is that our policies are driving our farmers to overproduce exactly the kinds of foods and the calories in those foods that we're already overeating. Acre after acre all across the land of northern Illinois and, and Iowa, across Iowa, corn, soybeans, two crops everywhere. The kind of food that we eat is the kind that's most profitable to market, process, and produce, not necessarily the food that's best for society as a whole. The vast majority of my neighbors are cropping corn and soybeans, and it used to be that with diversified livestock operations, they'd at least have alfalfa or hay or oats in that rotation, and that's pretty much gone in this part of the country now. Why are they just raising corn on corn on corn? Because, because corn on corn it. on corn, they get paid to do it. So they're not just getting paid for their corn, they're getting the government check. They're getting government-backed crop insurance, so if it's a bad year, they're getting a payment for that. There's absolutely nothing for fruits and vegetable growers right now. <laughs> Part of it is the loss of family farms by the consolidation of larger land holdings over the last 30, 40 years especially. About 75% of the government payments have gone to the largest 10% of those receiving subsidies. It's tragic federal farm policy. 
you are rewarded for a monocrop instead of being rewarded for diversity. The Tyson Farms, Purdue's, Archer Daniel Midland, Cargill's, the agribusinesses that now control livestock and grain sectors, they gain a lot from these subsidies too. Any policy that would result in lower grain prices is gonna go right to their profit. When you get to the processing level, then in industry after industry, whether it's meat packing, flour milling, grain transportation, pesticides or seed, you have a small number of corporations that control the farming operation through comprehensive production contracts. You have the specialization, standardization, consolidation of control. Once you go to a large stockholder, corporation, such as most of the food agribusiness firms are today, the only common value the stockholder has is to increase the value of their holdings in the stocks, which means that that system that's corporately controlled is driven solely by the motivation for profit and growth, an economic motivation, which is fundamentally different from an individually owned farm operation. It basically removes the decision-making from the individual farm and puts it into the boardroom of the corporations. It makes them enormously influential and enormously resistant to change. What farm programs have done to food is that it's turned them into commodities instead of food. Most farmers don't view what they grow as food, but as a commodity that's going to be fed to livestock or that's going to go into high fructose corn syrup and end up in all the soft drinks and it's contributed to an unhealthy diet. It's just the opposite of what it should be. Our fairly expensive farm program where we're spending $30 billion over the course of like two or three years sometimes on corn and soybean subsidies uh, is costing us hundreds of billions of dollars in the health industry because we're having to treat obesity-related diseases. Uh, if we were able to shift some of that farm money towards vegetables and fruits, or to even maybe eliminate that, that subsidy so you had a more level playing field, um, so that some of the incentive was there to grow fruits and vegetables and make them more cost competitive, um, I think we could have a much healthier populace and spend much less of the taxpayers' money. If you made it so that it was just as cheap to buy broccoli, or cheaper than it is to buy a Twinkie, I guarantee you people would buy broccoli. Ron can't grow 50 acres of broccoli because where is he going to take it? Yeah. You know, there's no market and for it right now. And what machinery is he going to use? Who's going to pick it? Who's going to pack it? Yeah. It's, a, it's a different it's a different system. Business. We have to have places to freeze broccoli. We have to have warehouses. We have to have cold storage space. That's why we would want to have some investments in infrastructure that really supports the whole fruit and vegetable industry. Fresh fruits and vegetables do not lend themselves as well to this process of industrialization. Local and regional food systems are one of the major goals. How to get the food that we eat produced closer to home so it doesn't have to travel halfway around the world to get to the dinner table. Good Nature Family Farms is an alliance of 150 family farms within a 200-mile radius of Kansas City. We're trying to integrate our small and mid-sized family farms into this modern food system and learning how to develop a process that makes it economically viable back to the family farm. Each farmer working independently would never be able to grow enough product to service a mainstream supermarket. What we find is very efficient and effective is everyone bring it together we call these produce hubs by everyone working together and having a central location to aggregate their product. It allows us to access these markets. Let's see, I think we have some yellow squash here, yellow summer squash. What we're trying to do as a small farm group is be able to try to make uh, local farm fresh foods, healthy foods, more available, accessible, and affordable um, to, to everyone. We call it not only being um, eco-friendly, but wallet-friendly, too. I sell a lot of processed foods in this store, but I also know there's a demand for good, healthy alternatives, and I think it's our responsibility as retailers, wholesalers, and manufacturers 
to, to provide those um, alternatives to our customers. We had a real challenge with our distribution model because a lot of those farmers didn't necessarily have the right equipment to get their product from the farm to our warehouse. Maintaining the refrigeration to get it to the, to the marketplace was one of the weak links that we had in the process. So we stepped up and we provided some refrigeration trailers to a lot of these different farmers. We're able to help the farmer get their goods from the farm to the distribution facility, to the end consumer, which is the plate. Oh, so good as heaven. As the local food movement grows, then you will create the confidence that, yes, we can move from this industrial food system to something that's fundamentally different. Is there enough local product out there to really fulfill the demand for all of us? What if all the universities, all the hospitals, all the school systems started asking for small farmer food? Sure. Are there enough small farmers to go around to do it? Not today. Not today. The answer would be no, not today. There aren't enough small farmers to, to adequately fulfill the pipeline. We have people who are demanding fresh fruits and vegetables, and we have farmers eager to grow them. The problem, I think, is scaling up and having government programs support that. So why are these programs not changing? Politically, no one's going to touch that. And we can never really have a truly good policy as long as we're worrying about a commodity group influencing the policy more than our interest in food. They have the wherewithal to encourage lawmakers to do what they're doing. We do not. Maybe we just don't have enough of a voice within American agriculture to, to make that shift happen. When We don't make, in this country, enough fruits and vegetables to be able to even meet the dietary recommendations of this country. One very important thing I think for us to consider as a nation is what the real cost of foods are. We're spending less on food than ever before, and we're spending more as a nation on health care than ever before. A lot of the business that I do has to do with people who are eating way too much of foods that are not good for them. The inevitable path towards obesity and diabetes is one that we're now paying for on the back end. What we're realizing is that food isn't cheap at all. It's very expensive. It's just that a lot of those expenses are carried elsewhere. And one of the tasks that, that faces us here in terms of making policy, but also in terms of making a new way to think about food, is that we're going to have to find ways to reincorporate those costs. People hear you say that, and they'll say, oh, great, you're going to make my food more expensive. And I'd say, no, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you when you go to the supermarket what this actually costs, instead of making you wait 20 years when you have that heart attack, you know, and you can't work, and you lose your house. You know, I'm gonna just show you up front what the cost is. You could make a parallel with industries that were polluting the environment by putting toxic chemicals into the ground or the water. The industries may not have known this was a bad thing when they first started doing it, but at some point we discovered those were having a negative impact on the environment and the industry had to be made to stop it and they had to help clean up some of the damage. How different is that from food? If you go back to the 1950s when I was a boy, the industry didn't know that obesity was gonna be a problem and they were just promoting their products. They tasted good. I liked them when I was a kid. Other people liked them. Everybody's happy. 
But then science started to show that obesity was a problem and that some of these foods were likely contributors to that problem. These are products that are making us sick and they have a role. Individuals have a right to consume them, but that doesn't mean that we should be promoting them in society and it does mean that we should be finding healthy alternatives. Food companies are trying to sell more today than they did yesterday. And if they don't, then they're not considered successful. And ultimately, if we are going to be successful in reducing obesity, people are going to consume less. And that's the conundrum. What would the implications be economically for the industry if they actually produced less? If we reduced our caloric intake by 100 calories. And it would cost the industry about 36 to 40 billion dollars every year. It's sort of like the, the energy industry isn't really excited about programs become more energy efficient because they don't earn anything when, we are, you know, when we're buying fewer gallons. The same problem besets the food industry and really is one of the biggest stumbling blocks to dealing with obesity. They have so many billions of dollars at stake in their profits that they'll do everything they can to fight the changes that are really necessary to help address the world's obesity problem. You might despair at this and say, well, what can we do about it because these companies are so powerful? That's what was said about the tobacco companies 30 and 40 years ago, and look what happened to them. Fifty years ago, tobacco was ubiquitous. And I think in 50 years, we'll see the ubiquity of unhealthy foods today in a similar light. So if the tobacco industry can be taken on successfully by the public health world, then I don't see any reason why the food industry can't be the same. Whether you're talking about oil companies or food companies, they did not create this problem. And they cannot be made the villains here. They have to be part of the solution and they have to have incentives that allow them time to change their business model. And if we don't do that in this process, either in climate change or, or fighting obesity, then that's a force that will not be in the game with us. We've made the decision that anti-smoking was a high priority. We made the decision that uh, um, fighting AIDS was a high priority. We make the decision that an ad adequate national defense is a high priority. So the question is, is this issue a high priority for the country? I do think we know in this case about obesity that actually everybody feels it, everybody's at risk of it, some more than others, but it's all out there. And most people, when they think about it, don't want it to happen to their kid. The things we have to do to change obesity are too important to do them only because of obesity. So we better find other societal reasons to make these changes because we're talking about revamping the whole way we live. A radical way of looking at some of these problems is to look at sort of how they all work together. And so to take the question as, you know, is this the food system we would design if we were starting from scratch? You know, are these the communities that we would design if we were starting from scratch? We have to invest in quality of life. People want to live in a city that's healthy, that's clean, that's walkable and bikeable, that's full of places they can exercise and enjoy fresh air. Having plenty of park space and greenways is also directly related to our city's health. And this is an area where we need to do better. Our state is ranked second, second, tied with Alabama, as the most obese state in the country. Tennessee also has the nation's fourth highest rate of overweight youth. Here in Nashville, the adult obesity rate is 30%. This has reached the level of a crisis. We know that to, to be healthier, we need to eat better and we need to exercise more. And then how you make that part of a city is, re is really the challenge. The 
this building is being removed because the connector will be a complete street. It's a street that will have room for automobiles, but will also have bike paths and a walking way and also public art. Helping to create an environment where people are in a position to walk more, to run more, and to bike more. We've gone to a lot more focus on sidewalks and bikeways and more pedestrian friendly ways to get around. This is the first bikeway of this extent that we've implemented. And you're talking about a 26 mile stretch that connects Percy Wan to Percy Priest. This is gonna be a major addition to our bike program for the city of Nashville. We're kind of excited about it. If you go back 10 years, we had roughly seven miles and now we're up to 130 miles. You're accomplishing the goal of, of getting people more active, but you're also accomplishing the goal of making the city a more desirable place to work, to visit, to live. What has happened with our greenways here is amazing. I can just take off on a bicycle and be gone, you know, and talk about freedom. That feels great. There's one barrier that I would like to see worked on, and that's more sidewalks. Right now, I walk on the shoulder, and it's, you know, it's kind of a crapshoot <laughs> whether or not you're going to make it. We're trying to dig out of four decades of not doing anything. When Mayor Dean got elected in 2007, he said, let's spend more money on sidewalks. This year alone, Mayor Dean's budget was $13 million. I think we'll see more people getting out and exercising. I just think it'll be wonderful, especially if they put it all around the whole block. <laughs> it'll be great. As a city, I think it's appropriate for us to be supportive of efforts to improve the health of our citizens, and particularly our, our, our kids. I, mean, I, I do believe that that's a, that's a proper function of government, um, and it doesn't at all negate the personal responsibility of individuals. It is wonderful that the government is saying, yes, we need healthy um, citizens, and that they're willing to put money into parks, and they're willing to put money into giving us the information, but we also have to come, and it's us that has to do it. There's diabetes, there's hypertension, there's cancer, or heart disease. There's something that needs to be stopped. There's a cycle that needs to be stopped. We can create communities that make living a healthy lifestyle the easy choice. We are working with schools, churches, and neighborhood associations to establish more community gardens throughout the city. And I'm using the bully pulpit of my office to bring a greater level of attention to the need for all of us, all of us, to get active and to eat better. Fifty percent of all firefighters killed or die in the line of duty die as a result of heart disease, heart attack. I think it's made a big difference in our department. And it's a win-win because of public perception. That way they see us out exercising. They can see that the fire department's trying to take care of themselves and, and, and be there for them. A healthy fireman shows up, you know they're going to take care of you. All in all, monitoring the health of our employees every single year, monitoring their abilities, um, giving them the equipment and support that they need to stay healthy is a way to have a healthier workforce. as familiar with what we do and why we do it. Hi. Hello. I'm Jamie. Can I give you your results back? Are you okay with that? Yeah. Okay. Um, here's your actual cholesterol. We recognized that the uh, health care costs we were incurring and which were ever creeping upward were becoming a major part of our risk management program and controlling costs in the company. Hi, Jamie. Hi, Jamie. We decided to target blood pressure, blood sugar, glucose, cholesterol, tobacco, and body fat. Your HDLs, those are your good cholesterol. These are, I call them bulldozers. They push that junk through. Mm -hmm. You want at least 40 and you're a little low. Walking, jogging, swimming, biking um, will make those go up. If you read on here 
and you find sugar mm -hmm. and divide that by four, and that's how many teaspoons of table sugar are in this container. Um, waste should be below 40. Um, high. A little high on that one. That's probably as heavy as I ever was right there. My weight got up to 243 pounds, I think's the highest I've, I've been. I was big. And talking to Jamie made me realize that I needed to do something. I need to start exercising. I need to start exercising. So I did, started exercising. And then the weight started falling off. I was stoked, just stoked. The belt I'm wearing right now is the belt I started with when uh, I was right there, right there. I was fixing to blow out of that, and we're down to here. Working out was the best thing I ever did. Best thing I ever did. This is the first year that we've actually seen a significant decrease in healthcare claims. The results we got this year have been a, a milestone for us to prove to ourselves that it can happen and that we are on the right track. The most important behavior to change this epidemic is participation. It's the most important. If we participate with our doctor, we change things. If we participate with our school, we change things. If we participate with our neighbors, we change things. One of the beauties about having this group of women that are uh, mothers in the community is that um, gives um, our moms in the community the opportunity to do things together, to become friends. We want them to be active. This is one of the most problematic areas in Santa Ana in terms of obesity. We have a lot, a lot of kids that are overweight here with no parks. There are no parks in this area whatsoever. In order to participate, to be part of the solution of this obesity epidemic, to participate, you have to feel that you have a value, that you actually can give something. This will be the part and this will be the first park in the 92701 zip code where kids can be active. Wow. Fueron siete años, siete años para poder lo que para alguien puede ser un un espacio tan pequeño para nosotros va a ser la diferencia. Tuvimos que ir al concilio, al concilio de la ciudad y esperar que que aprobaran que se pudiera hacer este parque, eh, esperando hasta las 11 de la noche porque nos dieran la decisión de un sí, las mamás con sus hijos, eso fue algo que, que se pudo escuchar la voz de la comunidad. It's astounding to me that in America we have to wait years and years to get a park for a community that is so deserving. The fact that Sarai has been involved and today Sarai is sitting at the table of the Santa Ana Building Healthy Community Steering Committee. And this woman that couldn't even articulate today is organizing this community. And she is my inspiration. Mm -hmm. The solution is in this group of people who are seizing control of the situation. And all around America, people are facing this kind of problem. Man-made problems that we can solve. There are ways that we can tackle this that will make a big difference. All right, where's my shark? Oh, shark! Where's my shark? Some of the things that communities are doing are very exciting. Increasing, for example, the availability of schools to double as parks after school hours so that people can use the schoolyard for physical activity. Across the nation, where schools have engaged children with helping to harvest vegetables, 
they found that children are much more willing to try new food. Cabbage could go up to 50 pounds. In the best of all worlds, I want a world that is safe for children to be active in and that the foods which will be healthful for them, like fruits and vegetables, will be more widely available and more widely accepted. We love the mobile market. We need this in our community. Smell good, look good. This is going to be a lifetime all the way around this neighborhood. Right now, this is about the only way we get fresh fruits and vegetables, so I'm promoting it. <laughs> If you walk with a walking school bus, raise your hand. This walking school bus is an opportunity to exercise, to socialize, and to learn about their community. Kids walking to schools, I think they get physically more fit and excited about coming to school. Brand new supermarket. They haven't had a supermarket in this community in 30 years. All of us on our time, volunteering, struggling, blood, sweat, and tears to make this happen. How do you like the market? Market means everything for this neighborhood. It's been clear to me over the years as I work with my patients that what they eat really has a major impact on their health, maintaining a healthy weight, and what better way than to have good, fresh fruits and vegetables? Every time I leave the doctor, this is the perfect inspiration to <laughs> eat healthy. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, that's why we put the market out here. We recognized long ago that in New York City, in poor neighborhoods, it's difficult for people to find fresh fruits and vegetables. The Green Cards program opened up only for vendors who were willing to sell fresh fruits and vegetables in underserved neighborhoods. Thank you. Bye, OK, bye, kids. This is not going to solve the entire problem, though, but it is a very creative part of the solution to the problem that we have. This spring, I launched a citywide health challenge called Walk 100 Miles with the Mayor, and it's not too late to sign up. We're asking all Nashvillians to walk 100 miles between now and July 9th. Hey, how are you? Good to see you. Okay. Thanks for being out here. Get together tonight for another walk with the mayor as part of his wellness and fitness initiative. And here to have some fun. But we're going to see this whole city before we're done. What's your name? Ethan. Ethan? You like to walk? Yes, sir. You in shape? You eat healthy? Yes, sir. You like broccoli? Yes. You like uh, fruit? Yes, I love it. That's good. Mango's your best? I know this isn't going to solve the problem or turn it all around, but what it does is it puts attention on the issue. It galvanizes the public to fight obesity, to make sure that we create a world where our children, our citizens, have an opportunity to live long, healthy lives. Good job. We have some clear-minded visionaries. We have the collective will to do many, many things, if we will but seize the moment. We're just walking for exercise. You want to join us? Come on. We can do something about this, but it's going to take a national recognition uh, that this is a priority. A fundamentally important question that we'll have to ask as a nation as we address obesity is whether change will come from the top down, that is from the federal government, let's say, or will begin at the grassroots level and then percolate up and become contagious. We have to be bold and aggressive, and we're going to have to stand up to very, very powerful forces if we're going to make these changes. And we've seen time and time and time again about a small number of individuals making a big difference because they care and because they have confidence they can make a difference if they persist. This country is known for its ingenuity and its willingness to roll up its sleeves and take on problems. And we can come together and figure out better, affirmative, proactive strategies to get our way out of it. Changing what we eat and drink, making it easier to do the healthy things, 
That's the sweet spot for public health. That's where we're going to see big social change. The government needs to be involved, but it's more than that. It goes all the way down to the level of the individual. I'm walking to lose weight and get my exercise in. And I've actually never walked outside until the mayor started doing this challenge. The weight of the nation is out of control, but we can fix that. We are seeing changes. They're not going to be overnight. They're not quick, but they're happening. And they are going to help control the weight of the nation. Thank you.